All right, we should be live streaming right now. Welcome everybody to webinar number 16, I believe. It's an open forum, open and ready for your questions, and we have one already. Should we an allowance to talk? All right, we're going to let this guy give us a question. Oh, can you not hear us yet? Cannot hear you now. Well, um, I can hear Curtis and he can hear me. So what can we say? Turn the volume up on your computer. Check us. Yeah, uh, to 11. Should we let uh, RH let him yeah, talk? certainly. All right. Uh, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, can hear you. I can hear you now. OK, my question is, I have a CS3, uh -huh. and I have some MFX locomotives. And I use the edit feature, edit local feature, to change the volume settings and the number of the settings on, on the uh, MFX locos. Okay. When I do that, are the changes recorded in the loco or in the CS3? So that if I bring that MFX loco to another layout, will the changes still be there? Or do I have, to, with, a, with a CS3, do I have to uh, change, make the changes all over again with the new CS3? Or are they still in the loco? They, they get saved in the loco. Yeah, so I don't have to change anything afterwards. As long yeah, the as they're MFX decoders, they would load up. Yeah. The yeah. only thing I've noticed that doesn't get saved in the locomotive, which is kind of a bummer, is the uh, the icon that you um, use in your central station. Um, that would be really convenient if that was saved inside the locomotive. That way you wouldn't have to go and find it all the time. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Lower hand, and yeah, I think uh, yeah. There's no um, even when we look at an edit interface here. Let's let's look at an old LGB decoder really quickly. So we're gonna edit. I actually loaded up these decoders in earlier. Um, so let's go into the edit mode of this locomotive. So they don't really have at least with the MFX decoders. There's there's really sort of uh, no way to. There's no button actually to save to the decoder. So it's generally pretty safe to assume that uh, because they are MFX, they're saving the, the changes to the decoder itself. Yeah, if you make some kind of physical change, <clears throat> like dimming the lights or something like that, you can actually see it um, do it to the locomotive when it when it happens, when it, when it saves the change. You can see the light dim to what you set it as. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it's tough to see that in the LED or, or whatnot. Yeah, and these displays do change. So if we have a different decoder type rather than MFX, there will be a button that pops up that uh, is basically a right to track. Okay. All right. Well, Mark has raised his hand. If you All right, let me stop sharing so we can sharing. actually let me open up the. Uh, I got to open up at least the chat panel and the participants panel. All right. Um, oh, did he lower his hand? Uh, well, you're, you're sharing a screen and it takes up my entire screen, so I right. do not see that. Yeah, it looks like yeah, he lowered, lowered his, his hand. Okay, it looks like Gary, you can hear us now, so that's good. Um, let's see. Do we have. How's everybody doing? So if you're, uh, I guess, a little bit of background, if you are an insider member, uh, there is a new items catalog that it's the, I guess, what is that? The fall new items catalog? Fall new items. We're going to this already. Are we yeah, out just, of topics? We usually hit this at the end when we're not. Uh, you know, we can just it's small talk <laughs> before we actually get into putting these guys to sleep. How's that? <laughs> All right. Something exciting before we put them yeah, to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so. So uh, we, we can get back to that later, just kind of giving us a chance to get caught up mentally here. Um, I mean, do we really want to just go right into the questions that we received through email until these well, let's see. the right does, questions? Does anybody else have any questions before we go to, um, here's one from Mark. Oh, there's a Q&A oh. thing. Uh, Mark says, uh, what's the best value, meaning uh, numerical number uh, for acceleration and deceleration delay? Um, <clears throat> for me, generally, I put uh, acceleration around 25 
Uh, and I think uh, deceleration about 35 is the numbers I've noticed that I kind of settle at. Uh, but because Curtis and I pretty much run our locomotives the same way, or <clears throat> we, well, we're running on an automated layout, like Curtis's layout that's got brake modules and stop sections and all that. Uh, we have to tune our locomotives into the speed we want to run and how long the braking delay is so that it stops within the braking section and doesn't go into the dead section. So that may change a little bit, but uh, in general, those are the numbers that I use. Yeah, I don't really think too much about numbers. You just kind of go by look and feel. Uh, it's most of the time, for me, like if I'm adjusting a locomotive and I don't really use, I don't really do it from factory locomotives. Um, I'm looking more or less at speed curves. Um, you know, um, a steam locomotive accelerates differently than an electric locomotive. And the same thing applies to braking. It, it's kind of like if you ever watch the drag races between an electric car and a gas engine. <laughs> it's weird, but an electric car, it comes off the gate really quick, but then it has less sort of an acceleration rate as, as, as most things do, I guess it declines the faster they go, but they do accelerate faster at the, uh, at the beginning. So, um, okay. Well, yeah, we're getting some good questions here. The brake squeal is the brake squeal operational with the icon on or off the brake squeal, uh, is usually always on. And then when you hit that icon, you're actually turning the squeal off. Right. So when it lights up, it turns off. Yeah. Um, and also, okay, so RH Phil just says, uh, you know, it's depend, the speed acceleration depends on the consist. That's just one of the factors. So the, the weight of the load that the train is pulling is the factor. Uh, the motor type is a factor. So, you know, if you have sort of like the C sinus motors or even the older C sign motors, they have low friction rates and, and um, you know, it doesn't really, it could roll forever sometimes. And uh, this is why uh, um, Rick mentioned that, you know, we adjust things to work around some of the brake modules because some would just, just roll right to the emergency stop section before it actually slowed down and stopped. Um, let's see, Jim Bentley, is there a program that would convert a YouTube video to a WAV file to load into CS3? Uh, well, you're sort of getting out of, uh, our domain, but yeah, there's ways where you can download videos. Um, sometimes I use, I use a couple apps myself, uh, but you know, be forewarned sometimes when you generate or pull down these apps. These things are rife with, uh, you know, viruses. So you just have to make sure you go through virus cleaning. Uh, I'll use a video download helper to sometimes rip videos. Um, you know, and I'm sure YouTube hates that. And then I'll use a AVC converter usually to rip files, sound and audio or video from each other. So I can have a separate wave file. <coughs> you're just, you're just kind of getting into a, yeah, you're getting into a hacking zone, which, you know, it's not part of our digital conversation. So you can research that stuff online. All right, uh, let's see. So David, uh, safety ahead. man, David. Uh, yeah, we cover Zscale, but Martha doesn't make Zscale digital, so we don't really talk about it much. I mean, I do repairs on it and stuff like that, warranty work. Um, he's looking for a <clears throat> Zscale in Iowa City, Iowa. If anybody near Iowa City is, can hear hear us right now, see us right now, let us know. Okay, so that's the Z question. Uh, there was a question uh, Mark asked, do you want to turn an event? Uh, I wanted to turn an event into a loop event, but can it get to get it to work in link mode? Um, what do you mean by link mode? Um, Are you talking about primary, secondary is the two central stations? If you, do you have a microphone, Mark? I can, we can put you on a speaker and you can talk raise, to us directly. Raise your hand. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so, 
Um, I have a I have an event, and I decided I wanted to make that uh, that event in a loop into a loop. Yeah. So I tried to drag that open the event with a a loop icon, and then drag the event into it, and it, it won't loop for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm not that part. I understand. I was just kind of confused as what you mean by link mode, but let's, let's kind of go through event loops right now. Um, well, one thing, isn't there in a, in, didn't you discover Curtis in a loop? You, you can't stop it. Uh, yeah. And there may be a way around it, but you know, I haven't really toyed with it. Since. Yeah. I'm not so much concerned about stopping the loop. Yeah. Um, because I, I can run this particular train without interfering the rest of the. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's kind of quickly talk about looping and macros. Um, so uh, eventually what's going on here is I'm going to open up this and let's see if I can, uh, actually give me a second here. I'm going to actually load up a blank configuration here. So you're not looking at here's, here's where everybody falls asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you sing a song and do a dance for them and keep them entertained while I do this. No, I'm, I'm forbidden to sing the song that came to mind. <laughs> All right, empty config. Okay, let me load this up. Should have, go pretty quickly here. All right, and so for uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, in order to access macros, you do need to go to the uh, setting. Is it settings track? Yeah, uh, let's see. Is that the right one? Mode. No, yeah, sorry. Unless it's in the track three. protocols and operations of your uh, when you enter the system mode. settings and you need to activate your events mode okay and this this actually opens up the ability to view macros now there's a couple ways that you can actually add macros one uh and this is sort of important you can add a macro directly and this this might hang up some of you because uh, there's like different ways to do things so let's add a macro loop now what you're looking at here is you're basically looking at loop functionality and you can all your steps here uh, whether it's a turnouts or whistles or whatever you want to do with your locomotive get loaded up in this stream right here um, where that the dot is unfortunately there's no cursor it's just right to the right of the macro now uh, what was hanging up with some people is they people would think that that's it that's this loop and you can just start it um, it's not necessarily true. Uh, I believe the gentleman here is talking about looping it in here. So what you need to do is when you have the loop macro, it actually has to be dragged into a step of an actual event, which is what FS1 was. So if you didn't quite catch that, let me delete this. So we just have the loop macro and we just need to create uh, just a simple event and it's labeled FS1. I, I need to delete it again. So because of the different ways that these things get loaded. We're going to uh, the edit button and we're going to add an event and it creates FS1. It's just basically your F. This container here is basically your event trigger. Uh, and that's sort of just coining a term on the fly here. That's your event trigger. You need to drag the macro into a step of the event trigger. Current the way, currently, the way it's set is it's in manual mode. So the way it would be triggered or the way I would start the looping event is by just clicking on, if I was out of the play button, I would just hit the play button up here and that should start the looping feature. The other way that you can actually trigger these things is if you actually had, and let's see if I can generate this, uh, I need to add an article and I'm going to create an S88 contact. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, this is connected to GFP 3.2, I believe. And so now what happens is you have, oops, whatever you're saying, I don't care. Uh, let's go back to the edit event window, drag this down. Uh, if I were to edit this event and now if I'm going to open this up, rather than being a manual mode, I can drag this contact and the contact now triggers the event. Um, and there are two settings when you have contacts, especially in this point, it's when it's the contact gets activated or when the contact gets 
shut off. And this generally is for track occupation sensors. Um, if your contact track is another kind of trigger, like a read a magnetic read switch or a, uh, a circuit track, which is basically the slider flipper, the on off position really doesn't matter because it's instantaneous. The moment your slider hits it, it turns on. The moment the slider releases it, it turns off. So um, that's your trigger setting. And um, what Rick was, I was referring to earlier is this loop is constant. You know, it doesn't, there's really no sort of, I think there's a, a maybe a control function to turn it off. I haven't really explored it too much, but basically it runs until you actually cycle through the stop um, bar on your uh, CS3. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, Mark. Uh, I just want to know, can you drag an event now into that second loop, or do you have to create your own event? Uh, okay, there is only one loop. Okay, this macro is basically the only thing that's looping, and I dragged it into the event trigger. So this is not actually an event step, okay, even though it's sort of doing it. Um, so I think, let's be clear, there is only one looping function in here so um, right but if you have a previous event a whole series of events can you drag that whole event down to the oh to the you loop? mean like if you actually had an event step that did something else so let's see yeah so your event does a whole sequence of locomotive functionality and uh okay so is you lights. potentially okay let me see if i'm getting you correctly here and this like loop. a diorama mode uh, okay, I, I'm not too sure how that you're playing that. Let me let me just kind of set something up here. Uh, let's just add some turnouts. It doesn't matter what they are. Okay. All right. So let's say you just generated an event here, right? And you right. It doesn't matter what's going on. You got three steps in the events, right? Right. This is just a simple event. In other words, it's right. a straight run through. It only does it once. Okay. And if if I'm understanding you correctly, you may have sort of had your loop function open and you decided to pull, oh shoot, uh, let me get. Let me Blink get. FS2 to the loop. Yes, that's what I was, that's what I'm getting at. Give me a second here to demonstrate this, but I got a, I got real estate issues. So let's say you drag <laughs> this in here. Okay. This is problematic because uh, well, first of all, any time, uh, like if you have a timing setup in here, so like you had one more step in here, let's add, let's add a text file. Cause that's how we add delays. So I'm going to add like a, a I'm going to add a five second delay here. Okay. So what this does, what this loop is going to do is it's going to run FS2 and then it's going to go to this spot and wait five seconds before it loops back to the beginning. Right. So cool. that's kind of the way the loop works. However, the problem here is FS2 now runs an independent timing schedule. It has nothing to do with uh, a looping itself. Okay. If this, if this function here, uh, and let's close this, if this is the function that you actually want to loop and it has its own specific timing, let's say I have this and I add a, I add a, a four second delay here, right? If I had a four second delay here, yeah, let's hate this window. Then it does that to me. Okay, you had a four second delay. So you're going to have four seconds before it hits W3. Now, the mm -hmm. thing is, when you do that in a loop, that four seconds is going to only activate within that script. The five second delay here is going to start the moment this thing starts. So now you have a four second delay running concurrently with a five second delay. If what your goal is to actually have everything work on a delay, then what you really want to do is not use, you don't want to nest. You do not do not want to nest this event. Instead, you should actually do it this way. You need to actually do within the loop, put these things in here event by event, script by script. Okay. And you okay, so if you have a pre-existing FS2, which which you don't need to add anything else. The FS2 is a complete cycle, time cycle, and you just want to drag that down there to a loop. You're saying you, you really need to build the loop 
itself rather than try and drag an FS2. It really depends on how you want the whole thing to time out. Okay, so now the way that I built this, this way, okay, what's going to happen is here, you got W1 triggered, you got W2, which now has a four second delay, then you have W3 happening after that, and then you have a five second delay here at the station name before it loops. That's a nine second total, right? Yeah. Okay, but if you nested it, okay, let's let's get rid of these and it's probably going to ask me, okay, if you nested this function, you have a whole completely different set of timing issues. So FS, uh, yeah, this is the right one. So what's happening here is this is going to start its program and it's going to go right to this. And that's where your five second delay. So you only have a five second delay before it loops back. Do you get, do you get a sense of why that is? Even yeah. though there's a four second delay in FS24, it's only a five second delay. Because once it hits this, it's going to go on to the next step. It's not going to wait for this to complete. Okay. Um, there may be ways to do that. Let me see if it is, because it could be a setting within the actual script itself. Um, no. Yeah. So generally, nesting issues, you have to sort of be aware of what your timing is and what's where, where the clock counter is, because you sort of have two different things that are Running if I didn't time. have the, the the last, if I just eliminated the last one and just did a macro with the loop, with the FS24, that would be okay, correct? No, no, it won't. No. Because what's happening is FS24 is going to start, and it's going to loop back and start again, and it's going to loop back and start again. And because it's not detecting, FS24 is running independently with its own four-second timer. So essentially, in the span of two seconds, or let's say one second, this could be cycling out five times, and you'd have five instances of this thing trying to run. And each one of those has a four second delay. Okay, so you're not, it's, it's a difference between running in sort of a serial or linear fashion, as opposed to running two things concurrently. And that's sort of the thing you need to be aware of. Okay, so yeah, you've already spent time building in this script. But if you want it to loop, you know, that that's problematic because, you, you know, it's like you're just letting the system do it. Now, the thing is, this kind of thing may work, for instance, if you had, you know, if you had a loop a track, for instance, and you had one contact that track that constantly triggered it, well, you've already set up a manual loop. Every time it runs over that contact track, it can start the event. But if you're trying to do things all automatically, you really have to be aware of um, how you're nesting things and mm -hmm. what is your loop timing. So, can you delay a contact track? Uh, yeah, you can add a pre-delay. That's not a problem. Um, so like here's the contact track. Well, that's macro. That's okay. So let's get rid of that. Okay, if we got our, if we got that. If you actually have this event here, right, and you actually want to delay it, what you can do is you basically what I would do is I would add a text. Okay, and it automatically puts it at the back, but you can actually move it all the way here to the beginning, set up a delay, and say, you know, five second delay, you know, and then what this was that what this will do is it will actually count off five seconds before it actually gets to W1. Okay. Can you, well, let me ask you this for a, a crazy question. Can you take FS24, so do a delay behind W3 and take FS24 and bring it in again? And start uh, your, and, and do a fake loop because no, then you're going to trigger it one more time. I can't pull FS24 into itself. Can you link us to FS24 again? Um, essentially, if you're trying to loop these three functions after another delay, you're mm -hmm. just going to have to duplicate these steps again. Okay. Okay. So you, you could never really build a, a pat, uh, event and then duplicate it within itself again to loop it. Well, you're, you know, to some degree, you're trying to cheat the system when, you know, your answer is basically just program these things into a loop. Why build it twice in a single event when you can build it in the loop? 
right? I'm just trying to find an elegant way of building a, a diorama mode with processes repeated at a certain interval. Well, that's what I'm saying. Do it in a loop. Okay. Okay, which you've already, but the thing is, what I'm sort of getting is you're resistant to building it within the loop itself. Well, I already built an event with a lot of timing effort. To exactly. It. So you are resistant to build, rebuilding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the thing is, it's the same thing. I'm telling you, it's yeah. like the easiest, most elegant way to do it is to yeah, build I got it in a loop, but you're trying to find a workaround based on the work that you've already done. So, okay. Uh, okay. So that's, you know, you, there's, that's the answer I can give you. I can't really elaborate yeah. on it much further. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sure. Uh, all right, let's sort of, where's the chat window? All right, did we, uh, I don't think he's, have we? We got a couple of questions here. Oh, how much you look at this while I uh, double check? Yeah, yeah, so uh, Paul's asking, how do you dim lights through the M84? I don't believe you can dim them through the M84 because the M84 is basically putting the power to a light, so to say, uh, from a secondary power source that you plug in, and all it's doing is turning it on or off. I don't believe you can dim it. I don't think there's any kind of uh, uh, electronics. That's a good there. question. I thought maybe you could. You can make them blink. Yeah, um, if you can blink them, then you could probably make them dim. No, because the blink is just the relay clicking on and off. There's no way to dim it, I don't think. Um, yeah, you make it blink it slower. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a strobe effect. Uh, yeah, we need. Uh, we so I mean, some I can I can re I can confirm. It's just I don't have uh, any of those things hooked up right now, so I can't do well, it. Right let's now. see if you can answer the next question. Let me oh, let yeah. me look up the catalog really quick on an M eighty four, and then I can let, it may probably give you guys an answer. A uh, catalog won't say it. A manual. Um, I mean the manual. Yeah. Well, when you get into the configuration of M M eighty four, it gives you the option to, you know, be a dimmable light. But I don't believe it works. I think I tried that when I was doing the um, the article on the M eighty four, and I couldn't get it to dim. But yeah, for some reason, right, to, yeah, uh, like, what is the it? Part might be that? possible on an M eighty three. What's the part number on that? Do you remember? Uh, it's so. It's not six zero eight eight four. I just looked. Six zero eight four two. If yeah, that's right. Two eight four two. All right. Yeah. Let me look. Let me scan through the menu really quick. And... Okay. So uh, Gary, Gary is saying he has the uh, locomotive big boy three seven nine nine one. Um, <clears throat> he put it on the CS three plus. Notice the smoke unit is on all the time and confirmed. It is supposed to be on when running in digital. Um, I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna believe you at this point. Uh, I didn't think any of them were on in digital. I always thought it was a function. And um, he goes on to control uh, say that um, that the function number two, which usually controls a smoke unit, actually controls the number board, which could very well be possible. I would have to dig out my big boy to verify all this, which again, would take too much time right now. Um, anyway, the, basically he's asking, um, uh, is it harmful to have the smoke unit on all the time when the track power is applied? Well, you shouldn't run smoke units if you don't have smoke in them. And I would think that it was set up so that, yes, maybe the smoke unit comes on with the number board lights. That could be. Um, the, I, they could be set to be on all the time. I'd have to verify that. But generally, if, uh, if there are smoke units, you don't really want to run them dry and hot. It, uh, it would eventually damage them and burn them out. But um, if you put smoke fluid in it, you're fine. And everything else, I would, uh, I believe you, but I would like to confirm it with mine. And that's just not going to happen right now. So um, that's basically the answer. Uh, okay, so uh, Michael is asking, 
how to change addresses on an FX decoder. An FX decoder would have to be on the programming track, Mike. Um, and you can just go into the setup page and select the address you want. I don't believe you have to program it to the track. You might have to, there might be a icon to, that shows a piece of track with an arrow going down to it. That might be it, but in an FX decoder, you'll see the lights blink that it's accepting the change. So you can do it that way and know that you're doing it. It is fairly easy. I've done it several times. Um, I even have, I actually could demonstrate it here, but you'd, you'd just be seeing my back as I do it here on this layout. So um, that's all there's to it. It is very simple. Just in the in the setup screen, uh, you can do it. You could also probably do it in CVs and write it to the CVs in the configuration screen, but um, I don't see that you need to do, go through all that when it's easier in the uh, setup screen. Uh, okay, so just sort of um, <laughs> a rough reference to the M84, and and uh, I don't think it's a complete answer. Uh, if connected hobby light signals, there actually is a way to adjust the brightness. Um, how the hobby lights, yes, yeah, through the hobby lights. So I don't know if they have the same sort of output. You know, if we had an M84, we could figure it out for you right away, but um, uh, yeah, I uh, guess I kind of took that question the wrong way. I'm thinking like uh, street lights, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, hobby lights, uh, yes, I believe you can. Well, he could be. You know, I, I don't know if you. I don't think you misunderstood him. I just it's referenced the. Uh, it does reference the hobby lights. Okay, we're actually getting a call from. Oh, yeah. I guess you picked that up. No, I tech yeah. support. Um, let's see, blinking random light addresses. Um, you know, it's yeah, so we have slight differences of opinion here. I believe it can be adjusted through the M84, but uh, um, obviously, uh, we don't have one connected and I can't really text it for you right now. Mark on clock lights, okay, so that's just like a standard uh, street light. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure you can dim that. Plus, I think those might be LEDs anyway, which are sometimes a challenge to dim. Uh, they could be incandescent still, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, yeah, incandescents, I wouldn't think you could really dim out. Not LEDs would be dimmable because it just basically, I think most of the M84 can operate on the the uh, pulse width modulation, which is what they use to change speeds on locomotives or dim the lights on any of the functions. So uh, there was a comment here. Smoke unit is on. All, uh, is that, did you answer yeah, that question? Was that a question? Okay. All right, I'm done. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, we do have a question from email. It was discussing loading and programming read switches into the CS3 plus. Um, read switches, um, they're really, it's basically all the same as loading contact tracks. Um, essentially, uh, you know, as if you notice when I loaded the, the contact track in earlier, uh, we'll just add an article. It's an S88 contact by default. And if you just want it to be a read switch, you know, you can just change the icon. It's essentially the same function. And uh, I got a real cruel thing I'm doing. So you're not sharing your screen. Yeah, no, I'm just kind of, uh, I didn't realize kind of torn that. whether to tell you or not. No, you should always mention it. <laughs> So yeah, it loads up just like any other event uh, contact trigger. It's just, you're basically just dealing with an icon change, whether or not it's a circuit switch, a magnetic read switch or contact track. And that's just as far as the software base, you're only just dealing with an icon. Um, you know, you can even mismatch it. There are extra functions here and it's still just the same thing, more or less. It's either contact or not, um, but uh, you can change the icon button like a train indicator, which sort of gray area. Don't ask us questions on that. It's something we haven't tested yet. Um, you know, it's sort of like a way that may be tracking of trains, uh, you know, a bumper stop, but essentially like if I have a contact at the end, it's still, to me, it's just a contact track, but you, you can just give it a more fitting icon if you, you find it uh, appropriate. But essentially these are your three types that we deal with contact tracks, magnetic read switches, or the circuit track. 
and you just set the icon accordingly. Uh, okay, so that uh, that was one emailed question. Um, all right, do you think you uh, you have uh, you'd be able to talk about that changeover board, Rick? Changeover board, uh, yeah. Somebody had a question about the uh, yeah. The question was lighter changeover board and installing it into a locomotive. Okay, changeover to... board for you guys who are not really familiar with it. Six zero nine seven three is it basically when you have like a rail bus or a, a train with two sliders that goes either way, like an ICE three or something like that. Whenever it changes directions, you need to have that changeover circuit so that the locomotive is reading off the leading slider. So go ahead, Rick. I'll yeah. And so the leading slider is what's going to activate whatever, if you happen to have a circuit track or um, something like that. And uh, so when you reverse, it switches to this forward slider when it goes the other direction. And um, I know they just plug into the circuit board of the, um, let's see, 21 pin mounting board, I believe, of the, uh, of a decoder. And um, I believe it just switches over in the relay itself. I don't know that there's any programming for it. I haven't actually installed one myself. There should be separate connection points for each slider. And that's they all you really need to worry about. They both go to a board on the changeover circuit. Yeah. Or a front slider and rear slider, so to say. And then the relay on the, that circuit board for the changeover circuit just switches from one to the other. And I believe it gets the signal from the circuit board of the uh, 21 pin circuit board. Uh, I haven't actually confirmed that, but that was my assumption. I do have one lurking around somewhere, but I haven't, I haven't uh, installed one yet. I haven't had the need to. I don't know that there's any programming in the um, decoder for that, um, because I think it's more of a physical thing. Um, but again, I can't can't confirm it. Yeah, I don't think there there I don't think there is. But uh, the changeover board is sort of largely an internal relay. I'm thinking when you change directions from the yeah uh, the locomotive, it just kind of sets up the relay on the um, on the changeover board. So <laughs> I don't believe there's actually anything that can be programmed. Let's see if I got one handy here. All right. Uh, you want me to go to another question? Yeah. Okay. I got a question. Uh, gentleman's using a CS3 with some LGB G scale trains. Question is, will Markland support G scale icons in the future? Um, yes, there is. Um, and two, you should be aware that, you know, they're just icon representations on your CS3. Uh, if there's an equivalent in the sort of like the Marklin icon set, you can use that one as well. I mean, yeah, maybe it won't be precisely the scale, but uh, the CS3 doesn't matter. It doesn't know the difference. It's just showing a picture of an icon. So let me, uh, let's see if I can load up a locomotive here. Yeah, I don't know where my changeover circuit is. Yeah. Okay. Oops. So we're going to pass that off to another day. Okay, so um, I do know there was a change to loading icons because I think there was, wasn't there an LGB folder that they use now? There was, but um, in oh, this PS3. Okay, let me, sh let me share my screen here. So here I have a locomotive. There you go. Uh, if you change an icon, you just need to just click on that and you pull up your library. Uh, the update has now an LGB folder, which now has a list of LGB uh, locomotives. And uh, what I was ranting on earlier is a gentleman had an F7 from, he had one of the F7s for LGB, and it didn't have the appropriate color scheme. Well, you can just easily just pick one of these uh, HO Marklin LGBs if it's available. Uh, other than that, you can just take a picture, um, and there's ways that you can load it in the CS3. But the LGB icons are now located in an LGB folder when you click on the uh, icon to change it. I okay. believe when you, um, even if you search for it by item number or the type, like the uh, 199 there, or 52MH, I believe if, if there's a corresponding HO, 
to bring because it up, but also the LGB. I could be wrong, but let's try that there. Let's see if we can see if I can do that. Yeah. So I just did a scroll search for one ninety nine, and it gives you everything with a one ninety nine in her. So yeah, the icons are supported. But like like many things, I mean, um, there isn't always an icon for the paint scheme you have. So like Curtis says, you can always take a picture and upload it. All right. OK, could you show how to do a simple read switch activation that turns an MFX signal and turn out switch on and off in an event? Yes, I can set that up I'm really quick here. So let's if you have something to comment on while I build up a board here. A track board page. All right, let's use a simple turnout. Uh, let's add a signal light. A simple one here. Signal light, and let's add. Let's let's see. Well, let's make let's make our two contact tracks read switches, or what uh, read switches? Yeah, let's make them both read switches. Okay, and now let's actually create an event. Um, let's see, edit event. Uh, we'll use that event. So, so we're going to use two events here. I'm going to use FS1 and FS2. I'm going to create my events first. So, uh, FS, okay, FS2 will be the chain signal in red. And we'll just close that for now. Edit that one and we'll make it W1. Oh, come on. I want this to go green. And same thing with S1. So those are my two events. Okay. And uh, let's see. Uh, that'll be it. Let's, let's get out of this mode here. This, so these are my two events. They are not triggered yet. This one was kind of pre-assigned from K1, which I did earlier. So I'll show you what's going on there. Um, just for clarity, at a trackboard page, I'm going to put my two contacts here, K1 and K2. We'll put K2 out here. Um, and so K1 activates these things so they go green. And uh, hopefully you're following this. I know I'm not verbalizing very well, but let's go back to events. Open up FS2. This is in manual mode. I want this to be triggered by, whoops. You're not in edit mode. Thank you. Edit event. I want this to be triggered by K2. And that will turn everything red. Um, so let's close this out. And uh, just, just to be a little OCD on you guys here, let's create some... Um, I actually need to edit the track board page. Now I need to add track bumpers and stuff like that, just so we have sort of a linear track that we can follow. Is that going I just put a line, a track line between the two. Well, I can't. I need connect. I need connection points to to put the line in, right? So, and all I got is a single. Uh, all I got is oh, a single yeah, turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So there's one end of the track. There's the other end. Let's click on this and rotate it so it's in the right direction. Oops, dang it. All right, so this is sort of your basic layout here, okay? Um, and in disregard, we're not even gonna connect these two. It doesn't really matter for this demonstration. Let me draw my track. So now I have a track line. K1 is here, K2 is here. And, you know, there we're done. So essentially what's happening is with a read switch, uh, again, it, it turns on here. 
Um, it kind of makes these things go red. But uh, let's see if this is working. No, it's not because I actually don't have power to the layout. So let's try this again. K1. Let's see. K2. Oh, is it activating? All right. Um, Afraid of that. Uh, let's see. I got to go back to my article. Your, is it your S88? Well, look, you're reading the, you're reading the, the decoder. Yeah, I'm reading that LGB decoder. Uh, let me make sure that I'm connected here. Link S881. Uh, what is this? Contact one, contact two. Uh, let's see. But do you have an S88 connected to it? Yeah, I do. I actually have a Link S881, but whether or not it's one or two. See, we, you, I got to tell you guys, we run into these things all the time. What's the configuration? Okay, so it's actually connected to S882. Uh, I have this memory of S881 in my system, so I have to correct for it here. Um, so back to edit articles. This should actually be link S882. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah, I did lower, that wrong. Lower right-hand corner. I did that right. I, yeah, I did that wrong. S882. And this should also be S882. Now, hopefully, let's go back to the page that lists my S882s, and they're both in here. So this should be correct, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> Love getting egg on my face for this thing. There you go. See? So that's when that gets activated. Nothing happens when it turns off. When the train goes to K2, it activates and goes off. So for such a quick answer, there was your full setup on how to activate something like that. It's just assigning the contact tracks to the uh to the event and that just triggers it and your the configuration here is you know you really don't have an option whether or not it's going to work one way or the other because your slider is typically about an inch and a quarter long so it's going to turn on and turn off almost instantaneously you said a read contact yeah um these are yeah whether it's a read contact or magnetic read switch or the circuit track the only thing that is different is a contact track because a contact track reads wheels on a three rail train set and if you have a longer train it's going to wait till the entire train passes by before it turns off um uh, so that's sort of the beauty of using contact tracks especially with a, a three rail system Contact tracks on a two rail system is a little bit more prob problematic, especially uh, if you're doing things like stopping and starting power to the layout or, um, you know, you're typically, I think a lot of like LGB trains, for instance, they don't have uh, current conducting wheel sets, right? So um, you can't even use that. It's just everything's based on around the locomotive. Uh, okay, so hopefully that answers that question. We have another question from Phil. The last CS3 update caused LGB Locos to lose the link to their icons. This was because the icons were moved to the LGB folder. Yes, correct. Um, okay, so he was just giving us a comment. Okay, yeah. As I said, all the icons are just kind of pushed to the LGB folder. So, uh, and just so you, you guys are kind of aware, um, these icons are, they can be written into a decoder, but sometimes the settings is maybe were pointed out by that update. The, the CS3 needs to know where to find them, especially it's, and it's in its low own library. So that might end up being blank, but if it was written to the decoder and you bring your locomotive elsewhere, you, you know, the icon would hopefully be with it. Well, um, I don't think they are because they're not. Yeah, it, it just kind of, I'm just thinking about that now. Some of the newer locomotives, they sort of give us sort of indicators that these things are not really loading icons onto the decoders. It goes, it goes, the CS3 goes by the file name given to the locomotive and that's what it looks for. It looks for the mm. closest match or a match. Yeah. And that's yeah. sometimes it's even wrong. It's not even the right kind of decode or locomotive icon. Well, that brings up an interesting issue because like if you had an LGB locomotive that you had your icons adjusted to and then you brought it to some other CS3 that wasn't updated, 
the icon wouldn't show up, right? <laughs> so, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, here's another sort of LGB question that uh, we've been getting recently. Um, uh, basically, it boils down to folks are having trouble programming CV values on the older uh, quote older, and I don't know if they're necessarily older, but locomotives that have the old MTS decoders. Um, this is sort of, I don't know, when, when you, if you want to just say it's rearing up its hind legs at us because we're, we've been getting a few of these calls. And uh, I think from what I've, if they're not MFX, yeah, there's sort of an issue um, being able to access the CV values. Right now, here what I've got is I've, I've actually got a bare uh, one of the MTS decoders, but it is an MFX enabled decoder. Yeah, that's and, not MTS. Yeah, that's M, that's the MSD. Well, that's no, it actually says on the box it's an MTS decoder or MS. Am I wrong? MSD. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, the, well, the funny thing is on the catalog they list them as MTS decoders. So uh, it's a, I think it was a first generation replacement. Yeah. So yeah, it could be an issue because I, I looked into the catalog from like last year and it was labeled MTS decoders, and uh, I don't even think they're in the newer catalog. So I don't. Uh, something's uh, five, going five, on five, with the decoders that we can't answer. Five five zero two nine is the current sound decoder upgrade. Uh, yeah, I don't know see. if there's a non sound one. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. The website just lists it doesn't list it as an MTS decoder. Um, yeah. And basically an MTS decoder is a DCC decoder. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you need to um, enter the CV number in the, in the configuration page. I think it's configura configuration and then enter the value and write it to the track. And I believe it's on the programming track. Yeah, for MFX enabled stuff, we still have access to all the yeah. uh, configurations. The latest version for the CS3, yeah, let's get out of this. And I should have the latest version. Info, nope, CS3. Scroll down to the bottom. Let's do this. Hugging. Where am I missing it? Wait, it's all part of the system, right? Oh, <laughs> I forgot where it is. Oh, device software information. Here we go. Uh, we are at three, uh, 2.3.1 parentheses eight. So that is the latest software version. Check that out. You can always check our latest newsletter. Yeah, I think we're uh, I think we're due to get our new one out soon, or we have to write our new one up, right? So just double check that right now to see what comes up. Uh, let's see. Two point three point one eight is what it is. As you said, you have an updated CS three. Good for you. Yes, good for me. Uh, we do have a question. You want to talk about the turntable and ESU? Ecos. Oh, a turntable. For some reason, people just cannot load a turntable correctly. I don't know what it is. Um, first off, you have to be very careful of the little sensor, light sensor pieces that everyone's complaining they fall out. Um, and they ask if they can glue them in. And we say, yeah, you can glue them in, but use a glue that you can get up like a white glue you can soak it in water and you can you can take it out just for whatever reason uh, you yeah don't you don't want it to be permanently glued in and i know that might be your intention yeah. but you do not want them permanently glued in there because if you break one off you can't change it if you permanently glue it in so something uh something temporary all it has to do is kind of just stick a little bit better than it does um I would even suggest uh, Curtis and I use the uh, Gouda cheese wax. I would assume a little bit of that would work okay as long as you don't, you know, glob it on there and have it all mush out. Um, 
Yeah, I like to use, sometimes I like to use a little bit of white glue because white glue is not really permanent. It's made for paper, so yeah. it's enough to get it tacked in. Yep. And it's not so rigid where you can't get it off. You know, just, you know, don't put a full drop on it. Maybe, you know, just scrape a little bit on there and throw it in. Yeah, it's, uh, and you can soak it in water for, you know, five or 10 minutes, then you can get it off. So um, that's kind of the important thing. Um, so I, because people sent us these questions a little bit ahead of time, um, we have a gentleman with an Ecos and uh, it's an ESU controller, uh, brand X. You know, so, so I'm, I'm sorry you chose the ESU decoder, first of all. I would assume that, you know, being, um, being that they are, you know, riding Markham's coattails, they will make an update for that controller at some point, you know, because they're always playing catch up. Um, at any rate, enough bashing. Uh, by the way, we, we <laughs> ESU, we look forward to your hate mail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Send it to Curtis Jung at. <laughs> So um, you can you don't need to install it as a DCC decoder. You can still install it as a Marco Motorola decoder as address two twenty five, as the manual says. And you should get a keyboard, a number keyboard page come up after you install it, um, and then you just do everything you want manually by that keyboard. Um, it, it's actually pretty simple. I, I had the opportunity to install one on a uh, on an Ecos and it, it it seemed to operate very easily. There is no indexing there. It's all manual control at that point, but it's, you know, left, right, turn around. You can do this, all the sounds, which I'll get into in a few minutes, how you can do the sounds because it's the same as a CS2 pretty much. But if you select uh, a function after 16, 16 to 24, or something like that, 28, 29, forget what it is, uh, you can get all the sound functions and all the light functions. So it is very user friendly um, for brand X uh, controllers. Now, as far as uh, people use it with a CS2, again, you can get all the sound functions in the keyboard. Now this is where it gets a little crazy. And I was, because I installed it on my CS2, I had to kind of fool it. And because what it wanted to do is it wanted to use the, the eight address, or excuse me, a full keyboard page. Okay, so that would be um, 16, 16 addresses. Okay, but it wants to use the first 16 addresses that it sees in a row. And that could be on separate pages, which is an inconvenience. So what I had to do was create a fictitious uh, turnout for the second half of a page uh, down in the last position, even though I could put it in the last any of the last four positions, I believe. And that would boot it over to the next page. That way I had the entire control panel for the sent for the um, turntable on one page. So after that, um, I went to uh, configure the, uh, the keyboard, uh, not the keyboard, but the layout page. The layout page, you can add the turntable to your layout page, you need a, a completely separate page because it pretty much takes up the whole page. You can't integrate it into your already existing diagram. So you can uh, create a layout of the, the turntable. And it gives you all the icons around it also of, of the, the track numbers you can go to, the, uh, the lights on and off, the sounds on and off. And I ran into a, um, a problem that it that it wanted to uh, enter the turntable twice, and the link on the keyboard page was to the wrong turntable, or I'm sorry, the link on the layout page was to the wrong turntable. So I haven't figured out that problem yet. We just discovered that just before this webinar. I haven't figured out the solution to that, but uh, 
it does seem that you can operate um, the, the turntable from your layout page. I just haven't figured out how to do it yet. And uh, we'll probably have an answer for you by the next webinar, but you can certainly do all the options in the keyboard page. Uh, CS3, again, it's a little bit different. The interface is a little bit better. You can uh, just touch the panel of the spur that you want the bridge to go to, and it will go to it. Um, the indexing, it will index and, and sort uh, exactly what spurs have a blank track or a operational track, and it will map that into the diagram. And then you just touch which one you want um, I haven't tried it yet, but Curtis says you can rotate that so that your entry and exit points are where you want them oriented on the screen. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, we haven't figured out the logic as to when you point to a track of what you want it to go to, why it turns left or right. We haven't figured out the logic. Sometimes it wants to take the long way around. And we haven't figured that out. I know you can set the direction you want it to go and then hit the button and it will do that. And maybe that's just us not doing that correctly at that right time uh, when we were trying to figure it out. Again, we need a little bit more practice with it and uh, we'll, we'll definitely do a little bit more practice with it. So the, the funny thing is, um, it's actually, I think it's actually pretty smart. The uh, turntable has 30 positions. The, uh, because there's 30 positions all the way around, technically the central station two, uh, as an example, only needs to know the first 15 positions. Now this is when you're operating it through the keyboard. So the first 15 pit positions are gonna be basically 180 degrees. And then there's a corresponding position because the bridge has two ends. So what, what they did was make uh, position 16 to, to 30 is what the functions are. The functions, the light on and off, the sound on and off, the horn on and off, the, you know, stuff like that. So when you look at it in the keyboard, you have track, an icon of a track, and then a number underneath it. And even though that's corresponds to position 19, um, position 19 would be, let's say, at, you know, at this angle, position, I'd have to do the math, before would be the opposite. So if you want to go to position 19, you actually hit position four and it goes to the position you want. Um, well, if you hit 19, it does maybe a sound function. So, um, because after 15, it becomes redundant because the bridge has two ends. They use those as function, uh, auxiliary functions rather than uh, positions on the turntable. So if you understand that, you will once you install it and start using it. Hey, you lost me. Curtis is shaking his head no because. Hey, hey you already lost me. Um, <laughs> let me, uh, I'm going to show the turntable setup here really quick. Okay. Uh, just so you uh, like for, for those of you get this or have a turntable, um, we have gotten questions that people are trying to get like a specific track to be track one. And um, it's it's kind of a challenge. Like if you load it up, the instructions basically say hit track one setting. That's going to be based on where the cab is uh and the cabin and if the cabin's not in the right place then um what you want to do is you want to click the manually track one setting here and then click on this button to unlock the turntable so you can rotate it and rotate the cab to what you want to be the first track and then usually the final step on either of these approaches is you run the turntable initial initialization the the turntable and then go a full 360 uh, and marking and numbering each one of these track points so again um you know when you first install it you really don't have a way to move the turntable so just hitting track one setting won't really do it 
good if you didn't really put the cab where you want it. So again, hit manually and then rotate the turntable before you do the turntable initialization. Uh, the other thing that Rick pointed out too is that, uh, let's get out of here and edit the trackboard page now. Um, you have, when, when you click on this, you actually have your rotation icon right here and you can then rotate your turntable to whatever increments you have. Now, just kind of be aware that because of the number of the tracks, well, one and um, one and 16 will be aligned perfectly vertically, but because now we have odd numbers on the tracks on the side, um, you're not gonna have a perfect horizontal track lineup. And um, you can see how I've, I've had to offset track one just a little bit just to sort of make my sort of connections to the track more correct. So it's not really perfectly horizontal and vertical. Okay, so just kind of bear in mind that uh, you have these little tweaks here. Okay. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say about the turntable. So. Well, yeah, good. Um, I'm... Uh, there is a question here regarding uh, different motor types. Do you want, I think you're the expert on motor types. Oh, uh, motor types. Ahead. Jeez, I, I thought I was going to pull out a bunch of different motors, but um, I totally forgot before the uh, webinar here. So is it something you can say? So he actually lists, we see things like drum collector motor, SFCM. I don't know what that is, soft sign. Um, yeah, that's, it's large flat commutator motor. Mm. Um, drum style commutator DCM and a small flat commutator motor. And uh, those are basically the standard motors that, that Markland's made for ever and a day. Those all have conversion kits for um, a five pole conversion when you're doing a conversion. When you get into the newer locomotives, a lot of them are now, um, they have CAN motors in them. And Markland started that with uh, different motors. Uh, they're still high efficiency. They're they're nice, smooth running CAN motors. They're not just the little um, RC car CAN motors that you get down for a dollar fifty. These are these are high end motors. So um, when you're talking about soft drive and C sign, C sign was um, both soft drive and C sign have been technology motors have been abandoned by by Marklin because well, I don't know why, but uh, probably developmental and uh, cost. Uh, that was back in 2006 or so. They stopped putting those in locomotives. Or yeah, like, one issue I had with one of the C sign motors, I think, or was it a can motor, is that the the barrel housing and the, the mounting on it, um, sometimes it was able to actually twist the barrel. And what it would do is it actually break the wire connections because they were oh okay yeah 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 it and once correctly. it's broken you, you're basically hosed because you, you don't have a working motor at that point yeah because those motors they had a ribbon cable and while you know i don't know how to convert a a c sign motor to a standard motor or you know even even changing the decoder to work with a c sign motor I don't know what the connections are to that ribbon cable, so I've never actually done it. And, um, yeah, basically, a, a C sign motor. Think about it as a standard motor, but it was inside out. Um, the flywheel was on the outside. That was what was what would rotate. They just basically inverted the whole concept, and it it's inside out. Yeah, the only the only way I've ever been able to sort of convert a C sign motor was that the you know it's just like. Um, locomotive bodies are fairly common unless they're absolutely new toolings and um you know there was always like like a v200 for instance um they had a c sign v200 but then they always had a five pole motor version of a v200 so in that instance what i ended up doing was, was just purchasing the truck because that's what the motor's mounted on yeah the motor frame for a v200 and then just mounted a five pole motor on that and then, uh, you know, when any kind of decoder installation or upgrade, sometimes we're just gutting out the electronics and just replacing it with the decoder. So you can always kind of convert it that way. But um, as far as the actual motor types, I mean, yeah, you got CAN motors, mm -hmm. flat commutators. 
<laughs> so uh, a soft drive motor was the next generation after C sign. I'm not sure if it's classified as a C sign itself, but it is the same kind of era. And um, the soft drive was a can motor. And unfortunately, neither of these motors are available from Markland as a part anymore. So, you know, if you have one that's failed, you're, you're pretty well um, going to have a challenge trying to get it to get it powered. Now, fortunately, with some of the soft drive motors, you can retrofit a um, modern can motor. Uh, where the soft drive motor fits. It, it fits pretty much the same. I've done it on a couple locomotives. It works, it works fine. I don't have to worry about the soft drive anymore. Um, and, you know, they, they run as good as anything, but I don't have a list of can motors that fit in locomotives. It, it's kind of by guessing by golly. So you, don't ask me for a list. I don't know. I don't know the part number that'll go into which locomotive. So, um, and after that, if if anyone wants to know, email us, and I can send out the email that describes the diff three different motor types for a standard motor: a, a large commutator, drum style, and small commutator, um, and the appropriate conversion kit for that motor. I broke it down rather than trying to figure out which locomotives had which motor, I broke it down as in which motor takes which conversion. So email us and I can send that newsletter to you. It's one of our handier newsletters. I've sent that to a lot of people. It answered a lot of questions. And we started not getting the question, what type motor goes into this locomotive? So apparently it worked. Yeah, let's see what uh, if I can reference that newsletter. August 2017. Was it that late? Oh, let's see. I don't, I'm not sure. Locomotive upgrade, x ray function. Let's see. No. No. It's there somewhere. 2019. I just, it's hard for me to read things with your name attached to it. So. <laughs> without falling asleep <laughs> overview of, all right so this was uh this is uh volume 30 number three so that was uh june 2018 may june 2018 newsletter um marklin motors overview of the various types of motors and upgrades Share your screen flip through it real quick okay where am i i'm gonna make you look at my article no it's not the actual article it's just the index Oh, well, we want the index. We want that article. You want me to pull up the article? All right. Let's see. What is that? What can is you real 30, quick? 30, 20, 18. Yeah, I can. 20, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Oh, a train pun. Good. Well played. 2018, number three. Uh, what did I say? May, June? Okay. Is that sharing that window? Yes. Okay. Oh, it looks beautiful too. So, all right. Let's just wipe out Rick's name. So, yeah. So there's a there are references to the different motor types. Um, that that one there in the picture at the bottom is the uh, drum commutator. Obviously, it says so right on top. Wait, the drum commutator at the bottom. Yeah. That one's that's, that's this one, one here. No, now you're scrolling past. Yeah, I thought this was a drum. Wait. No, no, that's a that's a small flat commutator. That's oh, this one here. Yeah. The DC all the five pole motors now the high efficiency motors they're all drum drum commentator. Oh, so they're actually the, that's what they continue call it consider drum. Yes, I was but, thinking the can is the drum, but no, no, because that's the drum. The commentator is a drum style, but mm -hmm. that's a three pole motor that you're pointing at. Where the yeah, five this pole is the three pole motor. And generally, we swap these out with the five pole motors. Yes, but it's a five pole drum commentator motor also. And so, and just so sort of quickly, if I can properly explain this so when we have a five pole motor uh usually sort of like the can motors or the soft drive motors what they did was they they actually uh greatly increased the number of sort of magnetic poles yes. so you know i don't know how many poles are in those not anything i counted um but um uh i think some people would complain that they didn't have the pulling power 
Um, uh, that's a C sign or soft drive. That some people did complain about that. I don't know how many poles are in those. Yeah, but physically speaking, sometimes I think it makes a little bit of sense because when you have like a five pole motor, you can have all these electrical windings around it, which gives you a higher magnetic pull. But, you know, it's kind of like the more spokes you have, uh, the more spokes you have, like say on a motor, the less room you have for additional wiring. So I would think physically you, you, it's hard to generate an electromagnetic pull. So, um, this is a flat commutator motor. That's a large flat one. That's a small flat commutator. Okay. So that's basically it's the, exactly the diameter here, right? That's yes. the big difference. You know, and the arms on that large one, it's, it's a bigger diameter and the arms. Are oh yeah. Uh, are yeah. Like these parts here. Yes. Yeah. So those are basically sort of the attractants around the field magnet, right? Yeah. Um, and then you have your different sort of motor frames or whatnot. Did you cover anything like yeah, that's, these um, that motor? There's no conversion for from Markham, but the this one, one here. This... Yeah, the one above it. Uh, that's a fourth type of motor, and it's only in a few locomotives. It's a class zero one, I believe, um, from the seventies, sixties, and seventies. There's a picture of it above. Um, and Markman did make a motor kit for that. It's an oddball. No, down, down, down. No, it's just kind of reading oh. what you're so getting us. It's good for them that they they actually did cover that last motor that's rarely used, and you have to order it as a part this one here. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, bear bear in mind, guys, that this is this is basically sort of an article you wrote about motor upgrades. So you know, we didn't really we're not able to really kind of show you in this article sort of like the soft drive motors or the old right. c sign motors so um so yeah that's, that's good no we covered that good enough for now you feel happy is yep. there any other article you want me to show these no you this is this is your stuff here and it's pretty boring <laughs> uh oh yeah look at this this is how you guys can program <laughs> a hidden staging yard <laughs> so, <laughs> there well, just there, that's has, my plug there if uh, anybody has the next three hours available curtis can go through no, yeah, this this whole thing is a conversation in its own, and you know we get repeat questions from, uh, you know, it is it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, so um, you can stop sharing. Yeah. So let's see. We do have a comment in the chat, I think. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some message in the chats from some of our our viewers, uh, talking about tax stuff. Um, okay. We, we do have one question there. Yeah. And it's just something that's been answered, uh, over and over again. Um, difficult sometimes to explain. Um, basically in essence, what's going to happen is let me kind of share the window, even though it's not graphically going to show anything. Okay, sure. So uh, part of what this question is about is that when you start up your CS3, your, um, when you're starting up your CS3 on like a new operating session, some of your locomotives might, might lurch or have a sound blast. And, and the question is why? Well, the, the real reason is that, um, it's sort of a difference between what memory is in what device. So for instance, if I were to um, take a locomotive, any locomotive, right? And I, and I set the function for a whistle, okay? And you know, I have its lights on and I'm running the train that way. And basically I leave those on when I turn off the layout. What's happening here is these functions are actually telling the decoder, hey, set the switch on and turn the lights on here. Okay, and that's basically held in a locomotive. Now, when you shut off your CS3, these settings hold. Uh, there's also another instance where these things are held is that when you have something like a brake module in your layout and your train's waiting at that brake module, Anytime a train is waiting on a brake module, it doesn't matter what you do here. It's not going to turn the whistle on or off or turn it off, 
on or off because it's in sort of in a stop section or a low voltage mode. There's no voltage really going to the locomotive other than maybe to keep the lights on. It's not enough to actually send decoding code out or actually it won't because on a brake module, it actually switches that section of track to DC mode. And um, essentially it, do, it will not receive the instruction codes to alter any of these functions. Now, again, this is the instructions that you set to the decoder and the decoder on the locomotive says, okay, my lights are on and I have my whistle on. Then you turn off your CS3 or your CS2 or whatever, right? And the memory on your CS3 is now clearing out, right? It's gonna empty out because you're basically turned it off. There's no power to it. When you start your CS3, um, it has no idea what settings these locomotives are set at because its own memory is wiped out. However, the memory is still sitting in the locomotive memory. So the way your system works is at a cycle. It just cycles and loops as we talk about everything is scanning the layout over and over again and sending out commands over and over again, whatever is a command change. It sends out a new command set. Well, if you haven't operated the locomotive, it's got nothing to send. So the moment your locomotive receives power, it looks at its own decoder and says, oh, my lights are on and I have my whistle on. So it's going to turn those on. And in some instances, they'll stay on until you physically just like click on that locomotive because any action you create on your CS3 is going to send out a whole new packet of data that just says, these are all the settings that you should be set at, which is, you know, the moment I touch this, uh, the moment I touch this locomotive, it's going to send out this at two. And if my icons are turned on or off, it's going to reset those switches. And so that's the only reason why it lurches. And for you guys who worry about this, don't worry about it. It's sort of the nature of the way the system works. You can't really fight it. It's a decoder setting versus your memory setting on the CS3. So asking this question over and over again, this is the same answer I'll give you. It really doesn't affect anything. It's just remnants of what the decoder thinks it was set at based on what you want it to be operating at. So. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, all right, do we have, I can stop sharing here. I think we have answered all our questions. If you guys have any other questions, let us know. Yeah, or um, Raise your hand and talk. We're coming up on an hour and a half, and we can uh, basically end at any time. Don't force yourselves. I don't want you guys to kill yourself searching for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Clamoring towards the stage to get an autograph from us. Yeah, we uh, we appreciate you guys on uh, YouTube viewing us live. Um, we are in a Zoom webinar session. Norbert Norbert had a comment a lot earlier, and I just want to acknowledge it. Good job, Norbert. I almost read that comment out loud. <laughs> Oh, you almost got me on that I one. Was unfortunate. <laughs> I was unfortunate. I know I've seen it, so now I got to look it up here. No, it's gone. It wasn't. It was in the. Uh, oh, yeah, it was in the, the chat one. It was in the answered question, or did you throw them in the dismissed? Answered, yeah, it's in the answered uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> was... Sorry, guys. We're going to keep you in the dark there, Norbert. Uh, let's see. Norbert's a good guy. Yeah. Oh, and Norbert, we uh, we did hear we will be going to uh, Amherst next year, so maybe we'll see you there again. Yeah, uh, I guess we got to keep an eye on the big E, the big E, right? Let's yeah, big show, E. See if they're yeah. actually going to hold it. As long as it's not canceled, we're we're scheduled to go. How's that? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, okay. I think um, that pretty much is going to wrap us up. Yeah, I think we again appreciate you guys coming in and, and uh, asking your questions. Hopefully, um, we were able to answer all your questions. And um, again, I welcome to the YouTubers. Uh, we should be about done then. Uh, okay. Um, I don't think we have anything scheduled, at least we will be going for our regular monthly. 
Um, we were a week behind this week, but then, uh, you know, we're just doing it monthly. We don't have a specific week. We try to do it the second week, but, um, I think January 1st or September 1st fell on a Wednesday. So we didn't really, uh, yeah, we didn't it, count that. Yeah the, second, yeah. the second one came up kind of quick. So, uh, yeah. we weren't ready for it and we couldn't send out a, uh, a notice. Yeah. So, notice. So yeah, we're going to, I think, I think as far as planning ahead is, I think we're going to look. Rick did a good job of at least looking into the uh, the turntable, and um, and then uh, uh, yeah. Think, no, go ahead. Talk 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 about this more. Tell us really about it. Okay, so there is sort of a a gentleman needs a, a CS3 reset. Um, I don't really don't know of a way to reset the CS3 other than um, going to the 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 Lear zip is a factory reset well, it goes to back, back to back the factory configuration so was that is that just the real i think at that point what you want to do is you just want to go to your system settings and you want to go to a store. restore and what file you're looking for essentially is let's see there's always there initial layer. backup CS3 no, no. Backup. but no, no there's a there's a i have an empty config because you usually use that well that you did right there Lear zip this that is, will that will take it back to the configuration is when you pulled it out of the box oh, is that right nothing okay. in there default it's got the default diagram and a couple of uh turnouts and i always use start config myself i think that was uh yeah actually you're right i that was my mistake i think the Lear zip is completely blank uh <laughs> no locomotives no uh no pay no no diagram no turnouts nothing start okay so the start config has that demo layout yes is the demo layout like it is out of the box sorry i got okay it. so that's why i created i created an empty config because i never would have known it was lear so. yeah i tried it once said oh that's where it is so, okay yeah so you guys yeah that's that's as close as you're going to get your reset now it doesn't it doesn't uh i don't think it backsteps the update so if you go ahead and do the up no if you do the layer you're going to have your current software up the operating system stays the same the current yeah. version stays the same but it it just starts it, it it changes everything back to factory settings yeah basically so all right let's see anything else i think I think that is about it, and it's probably a good time for us to sign off. Um, good. Good. We uh, we will be here again next month. If you do have any questions, yeah, it's kind of. I think it's best to sort of, unless you need your answers earlier, uh, you can send them out, send questions after you get the announcements that uh, when we're ready to post it, or just save them for online. We're happy to answer as many as we can live so yeah all right so uh that'll be it um you guys be safe take care mask up if you're so inclined or you know get your shots if you're so inclined um i'm not going to tell you what to do <laughs> yeah, rick's, yeah. rick's going out and getting his rabies shots next week so we're all good about that so. <laughs> everyone's happy about that yeah the dogs in the neighborhood yeah all right guys thanks for joining in Bye. We'll see you again next month.